Dana Hall. He is currently our president of ALA and he's on the uh, Skin Atlas Lake Association board. He's a retired aerospace engineer and uh, in his days at working for NASA, he contributed to the data systems for the International Space Station and the control systems for the Hubble Space or Hubble Telescope. Uh, fortunately for us, he's directed his capabilities to uh, improving the water quality and finding those solutions. He's going to describe now the importance of keeping the hemlocks within our watershed. So take it away, Dana. Thank you, Rick. I'm uh, bringing up my screen now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dana. Hey, Jim. Okay, so uh, screen check. Can you see my screen? Looks good. Yes. Yep, and let me do, uh, let's see, a little forward motion here, too. See if that's going to work. Uh, Did you want to do presentation mode down the bottom? Yep, I will. So it looks like my looks like my screen and everything's working here, folks. Um, my purpose this morning is to inform all of you about yet another invasive species, as if we need yet more. And so I've got my screen now. I, I hope on uh, full mode. Full uh, screen. This is one that's called the hemlock woolly adelgid and believe me it took me several months to learn how to say adelgid so think of this as hwa and um, this is a pest that has been in our region as it turns out for quite a few years but only in recent years has it become more active so i guess we could blame that on climate change as well um, so before i move forward i just want to take 20 minutes and my purpose is as i said to inform you uh, inform you, and, and provide outreach, but I wanna wave my pointer if you can see up here, the reference to Cornell, uh, Cornell uh, a very fine organization at Cornell called the Cornell Hemlock Initiative, Cornell Hemlock Initiative. Uh, they have a very fine uh, uh, website and we're fortunate that they are so close to all of us to help and provide training and advice and so forth. So, um, couple of slides just to remind you what hemlocks look like and uh, what the effects are of this HWA. So on the left is a healthy hemlock, kind of a, a lacy foliage, uh, evergreen obviously, and then you can see what happens as HWA goes to work sucking the sap, sucking the sap, and uh, then eventually killing the trees. Those of us in this area became aware of HWA or our awareness started to grow about a year ago now when we started seeing pictures from the Virginia Blue Ridge, the Appalachians, and then Pennsylvania um, of large masses of dead hemlocks. And we looked at each other and said, do we even know where our hemlocks are? How many are still, still in existence? They've, they've been harvested for generations, of course. And um, how healthy they are and we couldn't find any kind of an inventory so that kicked off about a year long investigation if you will or a survey so if you were to go out in your backyard or near nearby forest or, or whatever and turn over the outer branch of a hemlock tree at this time of year if it has hwa you'll see these white sort of woolly or cottony little balls you can tell that they are not very large because relative to the size of a hemlock needle, right? And um, I understand that, so this is the winter home, so to speak, of, of HWA. And I understand that they, the, they are feeding, they are sucking the sap even during this time of year. But um, come springtime, which may be coming soon, we could all hope, from those woolly sacks emerge these little tiny black bugs. Um, they're about the size of an aphid and um, they then reproduce and carry on with their, their um, annual season. So very, very deadly to a, to a hemlock and very important to our watershed or a bad situation for our watershed. So, um, 
Why are hemlocks so important to all of us? First of all, left to their own devices, they grow in dense stands. They grow closely together and their roots interlock. Um, I'll show you my hands here as if root tree roots are locking together. And locked together tree roots helps hold soil in place on steep banks and, and, uh, and so forth. So that's very important. Uh, places where hemlocks still remain in our watershed, we, ha we know now to be the ravines or gullies or glens or gorges, whatever name you like to prefer, but um, these cuts that go from the highlands around our glacial lakes down to the feeder streams like the Owasco Inlet or into the lake itself. And so you can picture these, these ravines and gorges and so forth as having steep to very steep sides. Hemlocks growing on those, on those lips and on those sides are what are holding the soil in place. Also, hemlocks have a very critical role in the uh, aquatic life cycle of, for fish and, and other species in the streams and so forth. They shade the streams, keep the water cooler. Uh, another very important role. And I don't know that I've mentioned yet, but hemlocks are a native species to the more temperate parts of the East Coast, as well as the more temperate parts of the West Coast. So think Oregon and Washington State and, and places like British, British Columbia. But here on the East Coast, I'm sorry, let me go back one more quick comment here. That very last bullet or blue box on there. Here on the East Coast, there is no natural insect predator. Nothing feeds on HWA. So they're just having a field. They're having a great chomping time, sucking time out there in our forest. Out on the West Coast, there are predator insects um, that keep the HWA and the hemlocks out there in check. And, and therein lies part of our future solution, we hope. Now on to the next slide. So as I started to say about a year ago, we saw these uh, very worrisome pictures from not too far south. And uh, we asked ourselves, first of all, where are our gorgeous gullies, ravines, and glens? And when I say that, I mean in the Wasco Lake watershed. And do they still have populations of hemlocks? We couldn't find any knowledge in, in uh, the county of any kind of a hemlock inventory, if you will. And of course, we didn't know how healthy or not healthy any of our hem hemlocks now are. So those were the central questions that drove a number of us to form a little volunteer group. We gave ourselves a fancy name of the Owasco Hemlock Hunters. And, um, but our real mission was driven by the people at Cornell, especially Carolyn Marshner or Carrie Marshner as, as she's her nickname. And Carrie used her experience, Google Earth, and um, tax parcels, property tax parcels, and provided us this map. So clearly you can see, I hope you can see blue, that's the lower half of Owasco Lake itself. And then there's this area to the south of it that's called the Flats that, you know, stretch down toward Moravia and Locke and so forth. Um, Carrie's help to us was to identify using Google Earth where the many gorges, ravines, gullies, glens, let me call them cuts, are located in, in, along the southern half of this watershed. And then based on her experience and insight, she colored them for us with the likelihood of finding hemlock as she looked down on them with, uh, from Google Earth and her experience and which of those cuts if they're populated with hemlock would be most important to try to uh, uh, preserve or, or ascertain. So the more important ones, if you can see the red coloring and then the next most important are colored orange. And you can see there are quite a few that she steered us toward. Um, this, uh, before I move on from this very important slide, this was our big road map, if you will, or lake watershed map. Um, you can see this long looks like a fish skeleton red area down here it has the number 54 in it um, that's Fillmore Glen State Park that many of you may have visited know where it is and as a state park we also heard as the 2020 progressed that HWA had been found pretty extensively in that state park obviously well in our watershed and uh, the trees there have been 
treated by insecticide to stop or slow down the HWA invasion there had been treated by the New York State Parks uh, Department or service. So yet another warning flag that we better find out what's going on in, in a number of these other areas. All right, so pressing forward. Um, so what transpired then in late summer and fall was that a number of a small number of volunteers, some of them from Aula and some not, uh, were trained by the experts at Cornell as to, in my case, even be able to tell a hemlock from a spruce, but but uh, trained as to what to look for to find HWA and um, how to assess the severity where we found it. Um, we used tax parcel information and it was really hard to find valid phone numbers for the property owners given that everybody now most everybody uses cell phones but we did reach 17 private property owners all of these these ravines and gorges and stuff around private property other than Fillmore Glen which is a state park but all of this that you're seeing down through here are private privately owned so we got permission from 17 property owners and in some cases they hiked with us but um, we were focused on just those areas those property owners that had these cuts ravines gullies gorges glens um, you'll remember that the early part of january this year 2021 was surprisingly mild in fact a few of us thought maybe winter wasn't going to happen but um, that was the opportunity that this survey set of volunteers used to go visit these 17 different ravines. So lots of hiking, very uh, rough terrain. And the good news is we found that not only are there hemlocks remaining along these ravines and down the sides of these ravines, but there are thousands of hemlocks. Um, but the bad news folks is about two thirds of these at least 17 representative properties that we looked at, two thirds of those have HWA, that are um, active now. So that's not, not such good news for our watershed. And as I said, the threat is if, if um, these hemlocks die, these hemlocks die, then uh, over a period of time, the soil that they're holding in place will in, in, big, in big storms wash into the streams and make their way into the lake. And our water quality will become substantially worse than anything we've seen in any of our lifetimes. Um, I mentioned steep sides and, and it's hard to convey in a photograph, um, um, you know, the, the sides of, of a ravine and stuff that's going down to a stream, probably waterfalls. But um, this picture is trying to show you a representative steepness. This is a typical hemlock forest, maybe with a few deciduous trees mixed in. Uh, younger hemlocks, none of these are very, uh, have very big diameter. But. And again, a photo of, I think I'm doing okay time-wise. A photo of uh, turning over one of the hemlock branches. This is what we did repeatedly on these, these hikes, these survey efforts, and looking for uh, the presence or absence of these little woolly sacks where the HWA were um, protecting themselves from the cold during the winter months. I, I want to remark that it not only was the uh, hiking good exercise and we had to be careful not to trip and fall and slide down ravines and so forth, but it was also a privilege to be out in such beautiful territory, all privately owned. And we only, we, we only went where we had private property, we had the owner's permissions, but, but uh, scenes like, like this photograph, this is Decker Creek near Moravia and um, all the green that you see here are hemlock trees, uh, very pretty waterfall. And this little concrete building off to the left here is, I was told a, used to be a power generating station pre, before World War II, all of its iron was stripped out to add to the war armament effort. And so what remains is the concrete shell of this former small power gener generating station, but very, very pretty territories that uh, we volunteers were, were privileged to see. 
So now, most importantly, I need to see if I can pull this out of my view here. Most importantly right, right now is where are we on all of this? So we have completed a, let's call it a representative hemlock inventory for the Owasco Lake watershed. Many other areas we have not looked at. And again, they're all on private property, but uh, at least we have a representative inventory. We found, as I said, thousands of hemlocks. That's good news. Lining the upper edges of, the, of these cuts and also going down the sides, in some cases, very steep sides. Um, further good news is most of the hemlocks that we saw appear to still be healthy. But we found HWA in a number of places, and it was kind of a, I guess a term would be a spotty type of presence. So some here, but not over there kind of phase. Uh, Carrie and people at, at Cornell tell us that that's a sign that the HWA invasion in at least around Owasco Lake and probably it's true around the Finger Lakes is um, still in its initial uh, moving in phase, if you will. So um, now note that in my last two bullets, I've capitalized the pronoun we. So if the collective we are going to take preventative measures while the HWA is still moving in, now is the time we better do it. Um, if on the other hand, the collective we decide not it's too expensive, too hard to, uh, you know, whatever, we're not going to intercede, then things don't look good for the quality of our water from at least Owasco Lake and probably any of the other Finger Lakes and maybe increasingly true of the Adirondacks too, as these trees are killed off by the HWA and um, you know, 10 to 20 years from now when big storms are washing the soil into the waterways. So one last slide. Um, the results of our survey are, is reflected, this is Carrie's diagram on the right, the results of our survey work um, are reflected in these, uh, these circles. The red are where we found in our, our opinion, extensive HWA infestation, the worst uh, in infestation. <clears throat> you can see six or seven orange circles and those are infested too, those areas, but they're more medium infestation, as well as some um, then green and yellow, which have not much or, or we couldn't find any. I, I've got to tell you that something that was surprising to us is Oops, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Something that was surprising to us is this infestive, invasive uh, pest has been moving from the south, moving north, perhaps with climate change. And so you would expect, or we expected naively maybe, that these ravines and gullies and so forth in the southern part of the watershed would be infected worse than the ones further up the watershed. Uh, that's not what we found. Uh, as I say, I'm surprised. You can see a number of, of these different ravines, deep, broad ravines, heavily populated with hemlocks, are colored green, or in, in this case, yellow. And as I mentioned, um, Fillmore Glen State Park down here, we didn't go into, we didn't have to because the State Park Service had already found HWA and had already treated them. But uh, lots of HWA there too, but we didn't find, we didn't find it like we expected to, although we looked very hard uh, down here in the southern part. And instead it was more up here in the, call it the middle of the Owasco Lake watershed currently. Um, a couple more minutes, please, of your time. So as I, I said earlier, presently in the East Coast hemlock forest, there are no natural insect predators. Such insect predators do exist though in the hemlock forest on the west coast. So our colleagues at Cornell are hard at work and have been now for a number of years um, importing the west coast predator insects back here and trying to get a natural biologic balance, if you will, established. Um, but that's gonna take a number of years, 10 years, 12 years, your guess is as good as mine. So the only solution we now have, folks, is 
I underlined the word targeted, targeted insecticide applications sprayed on the basal bark trunk of the trees that we want to save, sprayed on those trunks by New York State certified professionals. Don't, from what I'm saying, get any idea of a big um, uh, airplane saturation spreading insecticide or soaking the ground or anything like that. The, 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 the method that we are pursuing is the safest and that is to spray the trunk of the trees, the four to five feet of the trunk, of, lower trunk of the tree, or where hemlocks are close to water, shading a stream, uh, drill, the, the professional will drill small holes into the trunk and inject the insecticide into those, those openings, just like you or I get in a, a vaccination. So these treatments can take place in the spring and in the fall. I'm doing it again here, sorry. Uh, can take place in the spring and, and again in the fall. Uh, spring now is hopefully soon upon us. Maybe March will go out like a, like a lamb as opposed to how it came in. And these treatments of insecticide last something like five to seven years. So if the biological stability is 10 to 12 years away, we have two cycles of treatment that we're going to need to do. But, big, big but, there are thousands of hemlocks out there. That was the good news. The focus of our focus as Aula and, and so forth is on trying to protect the watershed, trying to treat only those hemlocks that are most critical to soil erosion. And so we are starting now, late March, certainly early April, and we're focusing just on the areas that we surveyed, recognizing there are lots of other areas that we haven't looked at yet. Uh, we're starting with the two worst infected areas, these two red circles, if you will, and then, uh, then going down orange, we've contracted with a couple of New York State certified professionals. And all of this, as you can well uh, expect, is expensive. Um, and how much it's going to cost, we honestly don't know yet because it depends on the terrain. It depends on the pace that it, each uh, insecticide professional can, can do in a given day. What, what I can tell you is that, that the Owasco Watershed Lake Association has donated $25,000. And so that's our, that's our starting pot of money. Um, we're, we are going to um, start treatments as soon as uh, thawing in the ground permits, hopefully later this month, and we'll see what the pace is, how many trees can be can be saved, and which of the many of thousands of hemlocks out there, um, the treatment professionals tell us are most important to protecting the watershed. The corollary to that is that means lots of other trees won't get treated, and we all are at risk of losing those. At least won't get treated by aula related watershed motivated um, uh, investments. So we're gonna go as far as we can this spring with our $25,000 donation. And having gotten all of that experience under our belt, we'll gather up more donations. Please help us, uh, please help yourselves in this effort. And um, we'll do another round starting in September this fall. And of course, next year and in, in, in this ongoing fight. So I think Rick, that is my last slide. And maybe there's a question or two if there's some time remaining. Rick, if you're talking, yeah, there's... sorry, I got a. I'm unmuted now, so well, uh, we have a few questions. Um, Carrie mentioned that uh, early on that. Uh, well, I got to find the right question. She ranked the conifer stands based on size, density, and proximity to water sources for, I guess, for your investigation. Good, good, um, good, good. Thanks, thanks, Carrie, for chipping that in and keeping me on the right track. Uh, has Cornell or others found any satellite imagery techniques for finding hemlocks to be useful? We have the same issue in Fairfax County, Virginia, and use mobile mapping surveys, but are looking into machine learning of imagery to help. Um, the answer to that has got to be satellite imagery 
drone flyovers, aircraft flyovers, none of that probably will be of much use because by the time the uppermost foliage in a group of hemlock trees is evidently sick, that may be too late to stop the HWA and, and save those trees. So it becomes more a matter of looking at them from the ground. And ideally, we didn't do this, but ideally even climbing up the trees, you know, to look under their, underneath their, their needles, but you can't see much from above. Okay, uh, question, if we find hemlocks on our property with HWA and we are not in one of the areas near the lake or stream, who should we contact? Uh, very good question, and I guess I'll put up my hand, <clears throat> hand to be a data collection place. Um, I'll tell you right now that the very best any of us can do, or this group of volunteers can do, is to point you toward one of several um, professional applicator people. And um, um, but, but anyway, that, that would be a very good thing for you to try to do and, and save as many of the remaining trees as you frankly speaking, can afford to do. And uh, Carrie suggested that they can contact her for, uh, to reach out to her at CAM369 at cornell.edu. Well, that's an, that's an even better idea. Again, thank you, Carrie. And if you and if they want to reach out to you and coordinate with her, you can also visit the nyshemlockinitiative.info. So that's, it's, but uh, let's see, uh, Similar to what's going on with EAB, I guess the emerald ash borer, can a combination of reforestation with species not affected by HWA and chemical treatments control the spread? Um, I don't know. I'm not a professional arborist, and but uh, Carrie, maybe this would be an opportunity for you to comment in, please. If you're in an area that does not have very much HWA, um, absolutely we are using treatment to try to slow or stop the spread, like in Lake George, in the new Lake George infestation up in the Adirondacks. In an area where HWA has been for many years, um, as this lake appears to be, I'm not sure, you can certainly slow the spread through your own stand. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to spread, stop the spread at a landscape level. I think but, the, but, the but, jury is- But Carrie, are there, are there other types of trees that could be planted to replace the benefits of hemlocks? I wish I had a good answer to that, and I really don't. We don't know of any other um, evergreen that would provide the same ecosystem services that the hemlocks do in these shady gorges. Okay, can I, uh, let's, how does HWA spread? Do they, branches fall in a vehicle and then that's driven somewhere else? It's sort of spread like boats do, boats spread the aquatic invasives? Um, in a variety of ways, uh, um, wind is probably a major culprit. Animals, deer, for example, as they move through for, uh, various eating areas. People um, going through a woods uh, get some of these on their, their clothing and brush against a, a not yet sick tree. Um, <clears throat> that probably these various these various mechanisms probably account for why we found HWA in pockets and yet a hundred feet away, we didn't find any HWA, so. Uh, okay, um, the suggestion was that uh, there are many farmers who are certified to apply chemicals. Can Partners for a Healthy Watershed help with hemlock control? Uh, they have to be certified by New York State uh, I don't remember what the level or notation is of the certification. Um, hey, Dana, this is Dan Welch. Can I jump in here? Yeah, please, Jason. Go ahead. Um, good morning, everyone. Dan Welch from uh, Cooperative Extension in Cayuga County. The pesticide applicator program in New York State is broken up into several different categories of pesticide applicators, and they're actually... Um, for there's a separate forestry category that is different from the agricultural or crop spraying that most of the farmers would do. And part of that goes back to what Dana was mentioning with the um, injections. It's a very different process. 
So, so Dan, um, even uh, a person trained to do farm insecticide applications, though, could be trained and achieve this additional licensing, so to speak, right? Yeah, they could be, but it would be a, an additional, an additional license and um, being New York State, um, there is a fee for that. <laughs> you, you don't get to add on categories for free. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we move on. We have a couple more questions before we, uh, I can get to the, Kerry mentioned that the HWA is spread during spreads is during its freshly hatched crawler phase when they're spread, like Dana said, wind, wildlife, and potentially people if they're handling trees. Uh, there's uh, the, uh, how, uh, one question was how, how can we someone contribute to this project, such as maybe our uh, Aula Hemlock Hunters project? Well, um, uh, uh, again, uh, kind of the same as who to contact if you have hemlocks and you want to try to do treatment. One answer can be carry uh, at the Cornell Hemlock Initiative. Um, a better answer since Aula is uh, serving as sort of the coordinator and manager and stuff of this campaign would be to reach um, aula.org, uh, send, uh, call me, email me, uh, Dave Carr, any, any of us uh, will we'll very much welcome your donations. And at this point, they'll probably go toward our fall 2021 campaign. Okay, I think uh, I want to say thank you, Dana, for initiating our Aula Hemlock Hunters and getting this project underway to treat the trees. And so we, I would like to move on. If you have any more questions, we know you, know you can uh, contact uh, Dana and uh, Aula.org. Uh, 